Lugosi, Cheney, Karloff. These are the original icons of horror entertainment. They were the pantheon of the macabre and were followed by actors like Vincent Price, Christopher Lee, and Peter Cushing. There are legends of horror for every generation, and when it comes to the modern classics, there are names that you'll find repeated, part of that new era of gods of horror. And one name rises high and above on that list when it comes to the sheer number of people he slaughtered on screen. And that name is Kane Hodder. Kane Hodder is an icon, having played one of the most famous slashers of all time, Jason Voorhees, more times than any other actor. Hodder's credits, though, are more than just Jason, and his personal life shows a man with a heart and will stronger than even that of the unkillable slasher from Crystal Lake. Hodder was born in 1955 in Auburn, California. Growing up wasn't easy for Hodder due to horrifying bullying, which he detailed in his autobiography, Unmasked. Kane was beaten up by the other kids he didn't even know. One story that's particularly disturbing entailed one of his tormentors throwing up in a bag and holding on to it throughout the entire day until he could dump it on Kane's head. Eventually, Kane fought back against the bullies, punching one of them while in the middle of an attack. This would be the beginning of the end of his being bullied. Kane's sharing of this truth in his life was an inspiration to a lot of people, and fans in particular. It wouldn't be the last time Hodder's life and story would inspire. Hodder would become fascinated with the world of Hollywood stunts, being a massive fan of action films. Kane would often do crazy things, like dangle off the side of buildings in school to freak out his friends. When he realized he could make a living off this sort of behavior, there was no heading back. His first time on film as a bit player would happen in the 1974 film California Split. Hodder was training for stunt work. It wasn't long after this first on-screen appearance that an accident would happen that would change his life. Local news wanted to cover the rising stuntman from their area, and so Kane offered to do a fire stunt for them, the type where you set yourself on fire while walking around engulfed in flames. The first time Kane did the stunt for them on camera, it went fine, but he wasn't happy with the way it looked. The wind wasn't right, and it didn't look as good as he hoped. He had the news crews come out again to film him. This time, things went wrong fast. A combination of the wrong type of accelerant and lack of safety measures left Kane burned over 50% of his body. Lack of proper medical care nearly killed him and left him to the point of contemplating suicide. Kane would, as he had done before, fight back. After having been moved to a burn treatment center and seeing that he could still have a life after an accident like his, Kane kept going. It wasn't easy, but he would eventually walk out of the hospital and back into films. Hodder would go back to the world of stunts and building a credits list that is beyond impressive, not just in the land of horror films, but across genres. He'd work with some of the greats in film, beginning with Wes Craven in The Hills Have Eyes 2. Kane would nearly get the role of one of Craven's greatest creations, Freddy Krueger. The man who wound up in the striped sweater and fedora, Robert England, would become good friends with Hodder over the years. There's a nod to this almost casting in Kane's cameo in the film Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, where we see Kane enter the house on Elm Street after some dubious looks at the camera. In 1986, Kane would work with the man who would create the role he'd become known for, Sean Cunningham in the film House. He'd work with special effects pioneer Chris Wallace on House 2, The Second Story, the following year. In 1988, he'd work with another celebrated effects legend, John Carl Buechler on the horror film Prison, which also starred a young Viggo Mortensen. Buechler liked how Kane worked and acted under prosthetics. This led to Buechler, who was in the directing seat for Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, casting Hodder in his first go as Jason. Buechler would work with Hodder a few more times, including the sci-fi horror hybrid Project Metal Beast, where Hodder would play the lead monster slash werewolf. Kane would continue doing fire stunts, which surprised a lot of people. Even though he shared the trauma caused by the accident, he's not afraid of flames. In the Friday the 13th film New Blood, Hodder broke a record at the time with a 44 second on-screen burn as Jason. He states that he did it by feel and knew when the fuel had nearly run out he was doused in. Kane also had the distinction of having taken Jason to late night talk. In 1989, the stuff of legend happened when Jason Voorhees was a guest on the Arsenio Hall Show, one of the biggest late night talk shows of the 80s and early 90s. I don't mean that Kane was a guest. Jason was. The appearance was in conjunction for the release of Jason Takes Manhattan, and it was fantastic. Jason didn't speak a single word, with Kane staying in character for the entire segment in full-on makeup, costume, and brandishing a machete. 
Arsenio Hall played it just right, and so did Kane. To this day, it's one of the most epic, at least to horror fans, moments of 80s late night talk and pop culture gold. Over the next many years, Hodder would star in various stunt and acting roles in favorites like Waxwork, Seven, Four Rooms, and of course, three more Friday the 13th movies, as well as motion capture for the Friday the 13th video game. In 1997, Kane would be a part of modern horror's massive star fest, the film Wishmaster. The movie would introduce a new horror villain in the form of the Jinn, played by genre fave Andrew Divoff, but it would see some of the biggest names in the scare set come together. Directed by special effects guru Robert Kurtzman, the K in K and B, and produced by the legendary Wes Craven, Wishmaster would have on board not only Hodder, but Angus Scrim, the tall man from Phantasm as the narrator, Robert England, Tony Todd, Joe Pilato, Ted Raimi, Reggie Bannister, Tom Savini, and George Buck Flower. The film is filled with Easter eggs on top of all the familiar faces, and of course the Jin's wishes all come with horrifying strings attached. While Kane's demise is one of the more amusing and memorable in the film, it sadly meant he wouldn't be back for the three sequels in the franchise. Another interesting horror fact is that Hodder cemented his status as one of the modern horror icons with the distinction of having played three of the biggest slashers of all time. Yes, that's not a joke. Hodder has played Jason, of course, but it's his hand wearing the glove that erupts out of the ground at the end of Jason Goes to Hell showing us Freddy dragging the mask down into the pit. So technically, he's been Freddy Krueger. Prior to that, Hodder worked stunts playing the infamous Leatherface in the more dangerous parts of Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, co-starring alongside Mortensen once again. So he's again technically been Leatherface. Out of the four most famous slashers of cinema, Hodder has only missed out on Michael Myers. The payoff for that glove-grabbing mask scene happened in 2003 when New Line Cinema gave us the ultimate showdown of Freddy vs. Jason. And while it was a fantastic moment for fans of the Friday the 13th series and Nightmare on Elm Street films, it would be a dark point for Hodder and a subject to be avoided for a long time after. Kane was given a script for the film and he was ready for the throwdown of all throwdowns. But what happened next was confusing for not only fans but Hodder as well. Supposedly, director Ronnie Yu decided he wanted a different actor for the role of Jason, someone who was taller and would seemingly dwarf Freddy. Debate still goes on if this is the case or if New Line wanted to go a different way with how Jason appeared on screen. As it played out, Ken Kersinger would be donning the hockey mask for the film, having done some stunt work doubling for Hodder in Jason Takes Manhattan previously. Kane would eventually come to terms with the decision, but it would take time. But he was still friends with Kersinger throughout and is still to this day. The Brotherhood of Jason is strong. In 2006, up-and-coming horror director Adam Green wrote and created what would become a horror fan favorite with the film Hatchet. Green was a massive 80s horror buff and only dreamed that Hodder would want to be a part of his film. Hodder took on the role of Victor Crowley, a throwback to the classic slasher films he'd been a part of in the past, but this time he'd also play the character's father, a role out of makeup that would allow Kane to show his talent, showing his own face. The role was a heartbreaking one and shows that he picked up a thing or two over the years working with some of the biggest names in Hollywood. Green would partner with Hodder for three more Hatchet films, as well as play himself in Green's hilarious horror sitcom, Holliston, where he'd poke fun at the drama that came from Freddy vs. Jason. He'd also portray a couple of real-life killers with lead roles in BTK and Ed Gein, the Butcher of Plainfield. He'd also get his chance to go head-to-head -head with buddy Robert England in the online series and feature film, Fear Clinic. Kane Hodder is not stopping when it comes to work. With starring roles in films like Old 37 and Death House, he's got numerous films that are set for release. In between all of these projects, the man who is the monster shows, as is usually the case, that the villains of the movies are some of the kindest and nicest guys you'll meet. Hodder visits the burn units of hospitals near his home, visiting kids as well as sharing his story of how he came through the fire and survived. Kane talked about the remarkable journey of his life in the 2017 documentary To Hell and Back, which has Hodder speaking in detail about the fire that nearly killed him, along with photos that were taken of the actual accident. He shares personal stories about the bullying in his youth, as well as the PTSD and fallout that happened after his accident, and how it strained his relationship with loved ones. It's heartbreaking at times, but also inspiring, and an insider look at a side of Hollywood we don't get to see often. Hodder has a devoted following of fans, and he truly loves them. He's a familiar face on the convention circuit, and it's because he simply loves meeting the people who enjoy his work, even if he is known for choking people. That connection, and what it means, 
can surprise a lot of people in the world. Kane Hodder's life and career are proof that you can make it and overcome whatever the world throws at you. And it also shows why we love the monsters, because sometimes they're the good guys. My first question for you, um, it really, because it really hit home for me, because I was bullied relentlessly growing up, um, mainly because, you know, uh, fat little girl, uh, I loved the stuff that you see around me. And, you know, it, it, it was bad and it went through a lot of years. Um, and I think that's something that horror fans have dealt with a lot and we're kind of the outsiders. Um, and that's why I think a lot of us gravitate to Jason. And I was wondering if you could talk to about that because so many fans have embraced him and you and love the character because he is uh, sort of a representation of them and they see horror as a safe haven. Um, yeah, I, I <clears throat> talked to many people that kind of feel that same way. And, you know, what, what really gets me sometimes is people that have not dealt with bullying, uh, the, the same way that those of us that have, have done, they tend to think, ah, it's no big deal. You know, it's just harm, the harmless playing and, uh, obviously it is not, and it can really affect someone. And that's why, you know, for a while I didn't really, I wasn't sure I should talk about it because I have the image of the badass and all that stuff. And so I hesitated briefly thinking about whether I wanted to bring that up or not. And then I thought, you know what, this is part of my life. So I'm going to talk about it. Uh, and without fail, uh, every person that has talked to me about it said that it was very uh, touching or helpful or whatever you want to say, but it was, they liked hearing something other than all just the tough, tough guy stuff. And it, uh, it has really made an impact on, quite a few people. I have so many stories of people that have related something that happened to them that was similar to my life and or something I said helped them through a difficult time or whatever. So it's very gratifying. I'm curious because you, you kind of came into the film industry and you, you just sort of decided, oh, that looks fun. I'm going to go do that. Um, Growing up, what kind of the what kind of movies really grabbed you? Like what what sort of movies like piqued your interest? I I always loved the action movies, the stunt type related movies, which is why I, you know, ultimately said I want to do that for a living. That decision was easy to come to. The process of getting to that. Uh, point in my career where I could make a living was very, very lengthy and difficult because I didn't know anyone. But I, I just always was amazed at some of the action scenes I would see in movies and think, boy, these people got paid very well for doing this stuff that I often do for free to entertain my friends just to get their reaction, like hanging off the balcony, you know, that story. So, you know, just to scare my friends. And then I started thinking, I do this stuff anyway. And there's actually a career, a, a, a very respectable career where you can do that for a living. So that's why I uh, pursued it. Once, once I got a little older, I started loving the horror stuff at the same time, never thinking I would be any uh, kind of notoriety within the horror business. I just enjoyed it all the way back to the birds. I'm curious because you've worked so many stunts and you've, you, you know, this, this, you know, you were known for that before even Jason. Um, 
can you talk about how the how you train and, and get into that? Because I'm I know a lot of my uh, I know a lot of people that love stunt work. They don't really know how to go into it. What how do you work and train for that? Well, that's a good question because <clears throat> most stunt people that are currently in the business had, I don't know, most, a good percentage anyway, had a friend or relative that was, had already been in the business so that this person, you know, once you're established, if you talk to your uh, contemporaries and say, Hey, my nephew or my so-and-so or my friend, he's very good or she's very good at this and that. And I think would make a good stunt person. Can you give them a look? And that will open a lot of doors just because a, an established stunt person is recommending you. So if you don't have that, which I did not, then you try to, become friends with someone that will help train you or something. Back when I started 1975, uh, there was a stunt school in Santa Monica that I heard about. And so I went over there and checked into it and, and found it, it was for me rather expensive and I couldn't really afford it because uh, I, wasn't really working very much and, and didn't have much money and never had any family money to fall back on and stuff. So I wanted so badly to become, become a student, but I couldn't afford it. So what I did was join the gym. It was in a gym that the building is still in Santa Monica, right on main street. And I would, like, for instance, the stunt school was in session Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But the students would always go to the school Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday also just to practice. And I thought, hmm, how could I become friends with some of these people without <laughs> having to pay the money for the school? So I just joined the gym and then just started hanging around and working out with them and, and eventually got training that way. And, and what's really interesting, I don't think I even said it in the documentary, but there was probably only like 10 students in the class at the time. And then me kind of hanging around on the odd off days and two myself and one other student, both went on to play Jason in Friday the 13th movies. I find that that's hilarious. <laughs> coincidental. I'm Morga who played Jason or Roy in Friday part five was a student there. And, uh, you know, we, we've known each other since then. And it's always, we always have old stories to tell about the school and stuff, but, um, yeah, it, it just, I was able to learn kind of on the job training by just hanging out and working out with them. Cause they, you know, it, they would always like to do, to train in a fight scene with somebody new. Uh, so they, they'd welcome having me around and stuff. So that's, that's how it started and very slowly, but I eventually started working. That's hilarious. That that the two Jasons came out of that place. Yeah. That's fantastic. You've played a number of on-screen killers. You've played a number of your, you know, your your horror royalty, uh, and and that's how I see you. Um, I'm just curious if you could pick. This is kind of a, a off the wall question, but if you could pick any of the classic movie monsters, oh. like from Universal time, which one would you pick? Like creature from the black lagoon who would it be well uh <clears throat> it's interesting because i had as a kid all the aurora models of all the oh. the, the creature <laughs> frankenstein wolfman dracula and they were 
12 inch models that I put together and painted. And that's when I was, you know, uh, God, I think elementary school. So I always loved those classic monsters. And, <clears throat> and I'm sure you won't find this that surprising, but <laughs> the one that I most identify with and dearly always loved, even when I was a kid and seems to be more, uh, my, uh, style of performance would be Frankenstein. Oh. Frankenstein. Yeah. I love him so much. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely, I could see you pulling that off really well too. I, I think you could get the, 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 like the, the sadness and the, you know, the, the childlike innocence part as well in there. I think you yeah. could pull that off so beautifully. So if anyone sees this, <laughs> this is this is your frankenstein go get it <laughs> ask me as frankenstein or i'll kill you exactly there <laughs> very simple it's very simple it's a good good uh, bothering technique for a contract <laughs> yeah i always am fascinated by and i've i've talked to other horror icons like you know jeffrey jeffrey combs was talking about finding the essence of evil because you like you were saying if you try to just act like a, a a comic book villain type and it just comes off as not not natural people are like oh that's just um where do you go because you you're mo sometimes you're not vocal when you're playing jason but your physicality and your presence you exude it you exude that darkness but then you've done roles like ed gein and you've done btk where you are playing someone who has your your vocal your movements everything comes together where do you go in your head to find that as an actor um you know with with people like ed gein btk i already knew their stories far be before i was ever asked to play the characters and i have always been a uh, uh i guess it sounds weird but a fan of reading true crime because <laughs> it's, it's just amazing to know that someone, you know, like Ted Bundy or BTK or so many of these guys were so likable and charming on one hand and then so diabolical on the other hand. And it's fascinating to me that a, a human being can be two different people like that. So uh, when it comes to playing that kind of character, it's like a, a dream role, I think, for an actor because you get to do both things in the same character. And that doesn't happen very often unless it's a character like this. And I've never been trained as an actor in any way. I have always said that if I possess any skill with acting, quote unquote, it's because of being on the set for so many years as a stunt person and being able to watch quality actors work. And, you know, you've probably heard this story before, but one of the biggest training sessions, I guess you could say that I've ever had was when I did uh, the movie called Monster with Charlize Theron. She won an Oscar for that role. So, and I was a stunt coordinator. I, I also played the character the cop that arrested her at the end of the movie, but I was on the set every day just in case some, stunt action came up but very often i was just sitting around doing nothing so instead of sitting around at craft service having snacks i would sit off to the side of the set and just observe charlie's while she prepared for scenes and i couldn't have had better training in any other uh venue than that situation because I could see her when she's on camera, 
performing, but I could also just observe her uh, techniques of getting places off camera. And that's the most valuable part of, you know, the acting profession is being able to take yourself somewhere and be so convincing. And, and, you know, so I just, I just have felt that that's why if I have any talent with that, why I have it because train, you know, when you train or take classes or something, you're absorbing someone's particular method of uh, that maybe works for them, but might not work for you. But when you just observe and take away what you think is important, invaluable. Oh, that's fantastic. I want a movie. Well, uh, within the industry, uh, certainly, you know, back when I started, I, I always say that the very first horror thing I ever did was The Hills Have Eyes 2, which is before I started playing Jason. And uh, back then, the general consensus, I think, at least I felt, in the industry among other actors and, you know, even directors and producers, it was kind of like... Uh, that person's a horror actor. So I'm not really a real actor because all they do is uh, <laughs> horror stuff. So it's not really acting. And which of course I would be the first to argue that being incorrect because I see people all the time that think, ah, you know, how hard is it to play somebody scary? And I think it's, very difficult because most people that I see trying to play an horrific character that's violent and terrible, they try to be scary and then it looks like acting. It doesn't look natural. And that's, that's the, the biggest part of my success in playing characters like this is that, even, and hopefully it doesn't sound self-serving, but it's, even when I watch, it doesn't look like I'm acting. It looks so natural, which I don't know if that's a good thing, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. But, you know, it, when you don't take the audience out of the scene because of them thinking, ah, not really convincing or trying too hard. So many people try too hard to be scary and, and then it looks just not believable and and not authentic and it takes you out of the scene. So um, along with having to battle those uh, ideas early on, eh, just a horror actor, um, <clears throat> you know, some bigger named actors that had done other things when they did horror, it helped bring some more respect as well. And then when you can play a character like I do. And then maybe like in the first hatchet movie, I played my character's father in a flashback as myself. So I was able to show some emotion uh, in a different character and, you know, all those things and just the general respect of horror nowadays is far better than it was back when I first started. One thing that I, I know I'm missing right now and as a was a is a large part of your life as well as conventions. Um, I, I was wondering from your viewpoint, if for people that have heard of them and have never gone or or interested in going to one, and hopefully soon they'll really start back in in power. Can you describe what it's like for a person who's never been and and kind of the environment and how it's like a big family reunion. That's how I see them. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because just this past weekend was the first convention I've done in many months. And it was in Charlotte. It was Mad Monster Party. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we were happy that that they decided to do it. Those of us that went, Andrew Devoff was there. Savini was there. Um 
Tyler, Maine. And even though everybody had to wear a mask, including us all, at all times, it, it really didn't matter. People still just love the whole convention scene in general, because if you're a horror fan and you can go to a gathering of other horror fans that you all have something in common, maybe you just like different characters, but you all have the love of horror. You can meet actors that you enjoy watching and take pictures with them and, and listen to stories, panels and different, different things and just hang out. And, you know, I've had so many people get so excited to be able to just have a shot together with me at the bar, for instance. And I'm like, wow, that's, I mean, that's nice, but it seems like such a big deal to people. It just it surprises me because, you know, those of us that do the conventions, we don't do them just for money. You can tell if there's a person there doing it just for the money. And most horror people just love doing the conventions, actors I'm talking about. And it's just so much fun. And then when you've been doing it as long as me, and I don't know if I uh, have talked about this very much, but recently a couple times and they, uh, a person will come up to my table and say, Hey, we met a while ago. And they'll be like, you know, 30 years old or something. And uh, they'll show me a picture of me holding an infant <laughs> at a horror convention. And it's that person now standing in front of me. So, yes, it makes me feel fucking old, but, <laughs> but, but it's pretty amazing to, to think that I've known that person for most of their life. And I, it's only because of the horror connection. I found my a photo of my first Fangoria convention that I met you at when I was 14. And I, I tagged you on Instagram with it. But there I am, 14 years old. And there you are. And I'm like, it was 19. Wow. Oh, God, I'm saying this. 1989, 1990. Wow. And, and and what's even crazier was that that show, there was Robert England and Doug Bradley, Zachary, Forrest J. Ackerman, Angus Scrim, like it was the massive show. And Doug Bradley has a memory that he actually remembered which um, uh, uh, metro train got off at that hotel. <laughs> when I Where talked. was it? It was in what? New York. It was in New York. And uh I'll have to send, I'll send you the picture. It, it's, yeah, do that, please. I have That's such crazy. 80s hair, like it's crazy. And you got a full head of hair and a baby face and you're holding the beer and you're just like. Eh. Hold the you're... beer, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, at, when I was in at my, Mad Monster in Charlotte, I was looking for a picture to show somebody on my phone. And I came up with one back, uh, I don't even remember probably about that same time somewhere around 89, 90 where I'm with a person I still know, but there's a group of us and it's myself, Gunnar Hansen. Oh, wow. Doug Bradley, R.A. R. A. Mihailov. Oh, who, wow. Other face. And it's so weird because both Doug and R.A. in the picture have hair. Doug has hair in the picture I have. It. Yeah. <laughs> and it's black. Too. <laughs> so it's kind of, he's got a head of hair. Uh, it was, yeah, I, uh, that was a fantastic show. Zachary was there um, and I got to meet Forey and uh, I have a great photo of Zachary and Forey and I and. Oh, you oh. got to send me that. I, I want to see the one of us. Oh, yeah. No, I will. I will totally send you that one. Um, so I know I don't have you for very much longer, but my my last question kind of goes along with conventions. Mm -hmm. And that is I have I've worked these shows. I've worked Horror Hound for like 16 years now. Um, and one thing that I always love and always gets me and it, it makes that's the reason why we do all of this is f some really emotional fan encounters, like beautiful moments where you finally get to meet your hero. 
And I've seen some big ones. I've seen grown men cry when they meet like Chris Jericho and tell, tell them the story of how coming home and seeing you wrestle has uh, saved my life. It kept, kept me going or, you know, your movies gave me the strength to keep going and, and things like that. And I'm always wanting to know, you know, what's one that's really stuck with you that has uh, you've experienced in, in um, at a show where a fan told you a story that, you know, you, it makes it all worth it. Yeah. I mean that I've had quite a few stories like that. Uh, the one that definitely comes to mind first, and uh, I want to be a little vague about it because I don't want her to be embarrassed in any way, but um, I had met a woman that sh wanted to show me a tattoo, and it was big. It's like this big, and it's just my face tattooed on her and it's a not a character shot it's me smiling <laughs> laughing oh. at them. really well done tattoo and she showed me and and I was red oh so ready to get good naturedly give her shit about having my smiling face tattooed on her because nobody I don't like I wanted this ah, nobody wants to see that blah blah so before I could she said she had uh, watched the documentary uh, to hell and back and it stopped her from committing suicide. Oh my God. That's amazing. <laughs> it gets you. Nope. I, I get it. She told me through tears that being able to hear someone that whose work she admires been through some tough shit too, totally brought her around. So there's a lot of amazing stories like that, that I've heard and been able to, uh, you know, talk about, and it just, it, it just, it's like the bonus on top of everything else. I love the work I do. I love meeting people and, you know, having notoriety for something because I never expected to, I thought I'd be a stunt man and nobody would ever know my name. And that was fine. But, you know, I, I just respect and, and appreciate what has happened because of the notoriety. So, and then you get things like that happen and it's a, an amazing thing. Yeah. I don't, I think it's important for people that get that hear and see and, and why we love this stuff and what it can mean to people. People can mock and make fun of and go, Oh, you're just a geek, you know, whatever. And yep. it's like, well, you know what? Did you save somebody's life? <laughs> Good point. Yeah. You know, you, you, so that's the thing is it gives, it's, it's really about love. It sounds so corny, but it really is in, 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 you know, and making a connection with people and bringing them together. And, um, you know, I've seen you at shows, I've seen the reactions you get at shows from people and it's absolutely amazing. And I know how much you mean to so many people and that's why I'm, I was thrilled to be able to get you for this because I, I know I've seen it. I know how much people look forward to seeing you and how much people just love your work and what you've done. And you are, you're one of our, I call it the, the new pantheon of horror gods and, you know, you're, you're kind of the Zeus of that. So thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very <laughs> much for those comments and, uh, you know. I'll always appreciate everybody that appreciates the stuff I do. So thank you. It's not easy. I've seen, I've seen what you, you put live worms in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody <laughs> talks about that. I find it minor, but I've done something so much more <laughs> difficult than that. But yeah. No, not to me. <laughs> that when I heard that, I was like, 
I think I'm going to go barf over here for a minute. <laughs> no. Oh, that's funny. But but thank you so much, Kane, for taking the time. And I will send you the link once this goes up. It's probably going to be about a month because we were okay. still putting together everything. But again, thank you so much for taking the time. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. And thanks for wanting to have me on. Appreciate it. Thank you so much again and stay safe. All right. Okay. You too. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.